This episode of The Kingdom of Graph is sponsored by the Autograph of the Month Club, where for just $20 a month, you can get a signed 8x10 photo in the mail. Please visit them at www.autographofthemonth.com. Listeners, prepare thyself, for you are about to witness two fine gentlemen muse upon the fandom realm, for you have ventured upon the kingdom of Graf. Hosted by Marco Guerrero and Michael Berkowitz. Hi, I'm Marco. I'm Michael. Hi, I'm Katie. And this is the Kingdom of Graph. And we're here with Katie Cook, uh, author, uh, mother, pet owner, illustrator, uh, fan of many, 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 many things. Uh, welcome. And everybody just ignore the uh, creepy mannequin in the back corner behind her. Don't worry no, about that. No, 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 yeah. we don't. We don't ignore that. That's Miranda. It might move during the show. Podcast. Miranda, some respect. <laughs> <laughs> every time, so right every time up. somebody says Miranda, go straight to Serenity. You know. Uh, well, it's um, uh, it used to house um, the Hamilton costume that I have. So um, instead of Lynn Manuel Miranda, since it's a female mannequin, uh, I just oh. called her Miranda. But as I've been rearranging my office, I took the costume off to do some, you know, getting the dust off and getting it on a more light, safe surface, things like that. So that makes sense. Well, I Speaking of Hamilton, right? Um, <laughs> Are you really big into theater or was it just really big into Hamilton? Like, how did that come to be? Like, Oh, no, I, I love Broadway. Um, you know, I, I go to New York once or twice a year for conventions. And we always make a point of doing a whole bunch of Broadway shows while I'm mm -hmm. out there. And, you know, Hamilton just kind of hit as a, oh, I like Broadway. And then all of a sudden we listen to it when everyone started kind of talking about right. it, uh, we were driving from Michigan down to Greensboro. Oh my God. It was a very long trip. It sucked, but we were listening to the Hamilton soundtrack for the first time. And then all of a sudden I was like, Oh no, Oh no, I have another Broadway obsession. No, no. <laughs> and, and people who don't know Broadway obsession is Broadway obsession. Right. Like my, my friend, Eric Milligan, right. He also did off Broadway. He was on the show bones. And every time I would drive somewhere with him, no matter where we were going, no matter it could have been five months ago or three months ago, whatever we'd ride together. The only CD in his car playing all the time was Avenue Q. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a one. delightful show. It's a great well, I mean, this was also like 10 great. years ago. So like it, but it's um, I I saw Hamilton three times. Um, the first time with the original cast, mm -hmm. and um, I got to go backstage and meet everybody, right. um, which is great. Um, I have some autographs from all of them, and we, I did like drawings for them. But yeah, I've I have seen a lot of Broadway shows over the past decade. Well, not not only did you <laughs> go, is, but you actually went like in full on Hamilton cosplay. I, I didn't, it was the second time I went and I wore the jacket, the jacket. Um, and the boots. And cause it's, I had a New York comic con. I did wear the full ensemble for one of the days. And then it was like, Oh my God, never again. How do cosplayers do this? It's so hot. Right? This is disgusting. <laughs> and I draw all day at conventions. So <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> what is wrong with people? Uh, yeah. Those conventions, especially the New York Comic Con, you know, doing it every year, it, it's long. It's a lot of work. And, uh, but, uh, so speaking of artwork, you uh, draw and illustrate. Uh, is that the correct word for, like, somebody who does it professionally? Like, I feel like I'm underselling it when I say you draw. But, like, that's your thing. Katie draws, right? 
Yeah, it's um, I I'm a professional illustrator. I tell people that I do a lot of commercial work. Um, I also write. I mean, I've written for Disney and Marvel um, and Star Wars and stuff like that. And then I write my own comics. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly an illustrator. You know, I, I again, I've done stuff for all of these different licenses. I've done my own stuff. And it's amazing. It's super fun. So I just tell most people that I, I work in licensing. Well, speaking of, <laughs> let's go ahead and pull up some of your artwork. I mean, I know I used to do some autograph sketch cards, and I would always love it, and I would always hold them back just to have you uh, – to illustrate them. And so you can see here, like. Yeah, those are like the little mini paintings that I do at cons. Um, so I take about two minutes and just do like a quick draw, yeah. very uh, Sergio Aragones-esque, and then add some watercolor to it. And so like, for those who don't know, what I would do is I'd have the actor sign blank ones of these. And then I would take them to you and then you would you know, do your little sketches on them and stuff like that. And like the funny story behind this one here in the middle, uh, I accidentally had uh, some Stephen Amell in the same stack that I had Lucy Lawless in, and she ended up signing two of them. And so I was like, man, what can we do? And so what we ended up doing is like some cosplay swapping where she's dressed as the arrow and he's dressed as Lucy from Xena. <laughs> But you also uh, did a book when when I first saw you at New York Comic or at San Diego Comic Con. It was called "Fuck yeah. You Box" and other observations from your cat's inner dialogue. How did yeah. this come to be? Like, you know, you were just sitting there one day and your cat, um, and you're like, mostly it. Um, I have a white cat who is now just about twenty years old. Wow. And even back when I did that book, she was the crankiest old lady of all time. So I just made this little zine um, based on her. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, my homage to my cat iPod, who I have no idea how. The vet has no idea how, but she's still with us. She's still alive. <laughs> And so the, basically the book is just going around and your cat challenging things, right? Like, fuck you, box. Oh, she, I'm going to yeah, sit in you. Is, yeah. Yeah, she is. She's not a great cat, but she's a great cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess is the only way I can put it. And everything about that, that little book is basically what I always would sit on the couch. I mean, if you're a pet owner and your cat walks by you have no choice but to like make up what they're thinking. Yeah. Oh, I mean, who doesn't do that? Who doesn't add dialogue <laughs> to their pets? And you've, so I just made a book of and it. And you carved out a really good niche for your art style, right? Um, and so like, for example, you have these books, you know, that are Star Wars books for children. Yep. And yep. Uh, I think there's what, six of them? And then you also, every year at Celebration, release this ultra-wide print, right? Similar to yep. this. This is, I think, from 2015. Right. And it's just... Uh, and you did one for each movie, I think, for a while, right? Like, Yeah. Yep. And then um, the, uh, the new one um, that is coming out this year is a story of three moments in Luke Skywalker's life that are all very long panels um that are called it's called uh, the places i called home mm -hmm. so it's him on tatooine uh him on dagobah and then him being a lonely old bastard in a cave with some words <laughs> right at the end well you know well now after the mandalorian we won't spoil things but well maybe not i don't know whatever we'll move on um <laughs> the uh the other property that you worked with that uh, that's pretty popular is the My Little, Little Ponies. Like you completely rebooted that, didn't you? I did. <laughs> um, I worked with Hasbro and IDW, and I wrote maybe forty some issues of the My Little Pony comics um, for IDW to tie into the um, the reboot of the show. And I started with number one. Um, so I wrote the first few arcs and then kind of 
you know, for five years, My Little Pony was such a huge part of my career mm-hmm. and my life. I mean, it's crazy. I even stopped doing the webcomic that I was doing at the time, which was Gronk, a monster story, because My Little Pony was taking up so much of my time. Well, I'm going to have to ask this, right? You've probably been to a, <laughs> a, a My Little Pony convention or two. And my guess is they're up yes, there with like furry conventions, right? Like, <laughs> okay, so all right, the bronies or whatever. Ninety-nine point seven percent of the brony community is lovely and wonderful and <laughs> generous and nice. But I don't remember them because I remember that point three percent. Oh yeah, that were terrifying. And it was like, oh no. Um, the very first one I did was in Brooklyn. I think it was called Big Apple Pony Con or something like that. And it was Andy Price who was the artist on the books. I was the writer of the books, and. You know, so I'm sitting there, I had recently, you know, maybe it'd been a year after everything started and it was huge and wonderful. And we were one of the best selling comic books, um, you know, for IDW and everything. And all of a sudden this guy comes up to my table and he's like, I have a concern. (laughs) (laughs) Which is like, oh no, what? (laughs) And in the show, they had just turned Twilight Sparkle into an alicorn. So she was no longer just a unicorn. She now had a horn and wings. And she had ascended to royalty. But this guy was like, are you going to keep Twilight Sparkle normal, like a unicorn in the comic books? Or are you going to make her a princess? And I was like, well, we've actually known that the princess thing was coming for a while. So all of the books that now come out after this point have her in her new role. And that's how licensing works. Ta-da! <laughs> and, Continuity. It's crazy. Yeah. And he started getting very visibly upset and he was shaking. And, you know, he went, you don't understand. And it was like, obviously I don't. Um <laughs> And he went, if she becomes a princess, and he's starting to cry, she's out of my league. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) And then, like, sobbing. And it's like, what do you do? This is an adult man. And Andy is next to me, and he's trying not to laugh. (laughs) He's like, well, you got this one. And it was like, all I could do is I like reached over and I was like, there, 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 like looking around for the convention staff. Cause this is like a little hotel con. And I was like, I'm uncomfortable. Tommy just has to find a, a genie and then the genie can grant his wish to become a, a prince pony. But it's, but each pony. each of the pony conventions has a story like that. Oh yeah. And it almost overwhelms all of the wonderful generous things that I've seen happen because I just remember she's out of my league. Well, the, and I was like, "Oh no. Unfor- what have I done?" Unfortunately, you know, that's how society and all clickbait media. I've always said it for years. Like I go to San Diego Comic-Con you see the media, right? Like you could have a hundred people, 99, nor- just normal everyday people that you see every day of your life, right? Yeah. And then you see like one person like that. And who's the news interviewing and showcasing and putting all over the place, right? Like it's, it's you know, obviously because it makes news. It's different. It's not, you know, it fits the narrative, right? right? Like yeah. everybody that goes yeah. to Comic-Con yeah. is Sheldon's clone, <laughs> the, um, Jim Zub and I do a panel at Emerald City Comic Con every mm-hmm. year that is convention horror stories where we just always talk about that 0.3%. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, we, we, like, we well, had Nick Stahl on a little bit uh, a couple episodes ago 
back in the day, and we talked about like what it was his fan experience too, and about a girl. Was it like hiding in his hotel, like coming out, like? Yeah, she like figured out where he was staying and like no. slipped stuff under the door. You know, just yeah, oh. crazy stuff. But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, so okay, so that was My Little Pony, and you've done Star Wars. We've talked about right. You've done your own mm-hmm. stuff. The the cat, the box, yep. the the Grok. Right? Did you ever? Did you ever have any issues with Gronk? Like the football, I know. No, no. Um, you know, <laughs> like Gronk was Gronk. my project, the Gronk. <laughs> and um, I actually got to do. It was so funny the um, the year of the Super Bowl where they had like I don't know a lot about sports. Um, Deflate Gate. Right. Oh yes. Where, um, because the um, I think it's the Patriots have the guy named Gronkowski right. who goes yep. by Gronk. Yep. So the NFL network panicked because no none of the teams would let um any of the players get interviewed beforehand because of the deflate gate stuff. So I got contacted by the NFL like a few days before the Super Bowl so they could film a bit because they were going around saying, Look at all the other gronks in the country. So oh I had the God. NFL network in my office filming me you know drawing a little gronk in a patriots jersey and these people were so funny because they were like okay who do you think's gonna win i was like who are they playing (laughs) yeah i remember saying that and that's why like i remember i remember that and seeing him in the jersey and all that kind of stuff and I also do another comic on a webtoon um, that's called Nothing Special. Mm-hmm. That's part of their originals line, um, which I mean, that has over 380,000 weekly subscribers wow. on it, which is way bigger than Gronk ever. That's the one with like the, the radish that follows you around. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody, you know, watching in the comments, there's a link to her website, Katie Can Draw, and it links to all that kind of stuff. Um, yep. So b- make sure to check it out. Uh, so you've worked, I've seen you work on, you've done a lot of cover, alternate covers for comics. Um, yep. I saw a Doctor Who one, or was that not a comic, or is that just fan that you did? No, no, that was um, a uh, alternate for uh, the Doctor Who number right. one, uh, when they revitalized And that was IDW it with again, yeah. Was it I? Oh, I never remember yeah. anymore. Um, and then I've done a bunch of Marvel ones. Um, I've only I've only really done one DC project, and then lately I just wrote um, three issues of uh, Marvel stuff, uh, the Avengers for IDW, and I just wrote some Star Wars for IDW. So I just get to I get to draw and write all the fun things right so now. <laughs> Quarantine's going great. We had <laughs> Keith the different Dom, Domenico or something like that. I think I, can't, I always pronounce his last name wrong. But he also writes uh, a lot of licensed books. Like he did the super first four supernatural books. He did the Sereno, yeah. Serenity Novela. Uh, um, and so we asked him, "What are the pressures of writing for a fandom?" I mean, you, you talked a little bit, uh, touched a little bit about it on um, My Little Pony, but like the the stress of writing, you know, for these huge properties you know and everybody's like fact checking you and questioning you and you know what's that like for you uh it it really depends on the property you know in the beginning with my little pony if you ever look at the first four issue arc Mm -hmm. i don't think anybody in licensing actually looked at it um there are like references to it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, just it is it is horrifically terrifying. It's very dark. Um, there's kidnapping. There's you know giant fights. There's terrible horse puns. And after the book got really popular, um, I think people finally started like, oh no, we should read whatever weird stuff. No, oh, over a hundred thousand people buy these. And it was like okay, but then there are properties where it's like ugh. Because, you know, if I draw something for Star Wars, even though it's cutesy and fun, 
you know, you still have to have a certain likeness to the actor or the costume has to be correct or it needs to be recognizable as this creature. And same thing goes for, you know, Marvel. I got a couple of, of notes, you know, for, you know, part of things take place in a school. And I was trying to make Captain America is in charge of like a kindergarten safety town. Um <laughs> Because it's a kid's book, and I thought it'd be so funny to put like the like one of the main Avengers goes in to try and be helpful for the day, and he's just surrounded by six year olds, like neighborhood and watch. Yeah, yeah, and it's terrifying. <laughs> and there were just so many rules about how dangerous of a situation you could put kids in. Because I put paste pot peat in it, which is the <laughs> lamest of all of the Marvel superheroes. And even the people at Marvel are like, you you have been given carte blanche to do whatever you want. And this is what you're going to do. And it was like, yeah. <laughs> do, you feel like, do you feel like when you do like um, versus like story writing versus like just getting to do like a variant cover, do you feel like you have a little bit more leeway with variant covers? Variant covers are, yeah, they're very different. You're allowed to kind of go nuts and do something kind of fun. I mean, just look at Scotty Young's work. I was literally just um, thinking you yeah. and Scotty Young because yeah. um, he's, he's very like just that cutesy kind of art style, but mm -hmm. at the same time, kind of like with a twist. Yeah, it's, you know, like I did a, a Deadpool variant cover where he is surrounded by his merchandise. <laughs> and the only rule was you couldn't use anything that was actual merchandise. So I did like Deadpool the toilet seat. Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he had one of those little beer hats on that was full of like Deadpool's vanilla flavored absinthe. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> um, so it was like a B. Arthur Deadpool doll uh, and it, a body pillow. My bo the body pillow is my longest running gag in all of my work for all of eternity. Ever since I figured out what the the sexy anime body pillows are, I just find them hysterical. <laughs> okay, so um, funny funny story. I, nobody knows this. So we have companies reach out to us to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they send products to us that they want us to open on YouTube. And I got an email back when back when we were just starting, like we had like 250 subscribers. Mm -hmm. I got an email from this company. It was like, hey, we like to send you a box of our products to open up. And I clicked the link. I'm at work. <laughs> and I clicked, I clicked the link. And all of a sudden, these pillows pop up with holes in them and naked anime chicks. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, clearly you haven't watched our channel. You don't. <laughs> I had no clue about that stuff. Like, I didn't even know that was a big thing. Oh, my God. Over Christmas, um, <laughs> I got my husband just a normal, like, tempur body pillow because he's a yeah. pillow hugger at night. Yeah. And I was trying to send him covers for it. And I found... <laughs> Somebody made one that's supposed to be like the sexy anime pose, but it's just another body pillow and it's like positioned so it has a little curved butt, but it's just a pillow. There's absolutely <laughs> nothing intriguing or whatever about it, except it's got a lump in it that looks kind of like a butt and a back that's arched. And it was like, this is what I'm getting you. And he was like, no. I, I love giving gifts like that. Like one of the best things, one of the things that I have in my house that, that I love uh, when guests come over is in the guest bathroom, I have a shower curtain of uh, of Jeff Goldblum with the gorilla, like that, you know, the meme of him and the gorilla, like with his shirt off, you know. And so you walk into the bathroom and the first thing you see is this giant uh, uh, shower curtain of him. <laughs> and then my sister, who's terrified of monkeys, and you're just sitting down at the toilet and there's a giant monkey like... <laughs> <laughs> the things you can get on the internet, all right? All the things to be terrified of. Monkeys are a bad choice. Because that's what we all basically are. <laughs> yeah, that's what we, yeah, you're afraid of yourself. Yeah, it's... Uh, that's so funny. But we though. do have some... Yeah, I had no idea that those things existed. Those pillows, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no oh, idea. Oh, so funny. The, and the, the, the extent of, like... The boob ones, it, like, I had no clue. I I was, and I'm not sheltered. I just didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> boob ones, butt ones. Hey, I was part of the My Little Pony fandom. I know what all the pillows are now. 
<laughs> oh yeah. So we do have some questions in the chat. People want to know if they go to your website and do you have signed copies of your books and work? Cause we do a lot of autographs, obviously and a lot of our collectors. I, I don't because almost everything I do is available from Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever I get a comp copy of everything, like I either throw it at my kids and I'm like, here, I have some my little pony or I go <laughs> shove it in one of the little libraries around town. <laughs> <laughs> it's hopefully the way to get something signed is at a con. Yeah, conventions will hopefully be back eventually. So I would like that. My wallet yeah. would like that. That'd be great. But it's I I will always sign things for free, um, unless the um, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund funks a carton down on my table, <laughs> oh, and then you got to put a dollar in the bucket. Well, I mean, I remember, <laughs> like, I, like I said, I I go back like. Did you start with sketch cards with like tops or like, did you start? Oh yeah. Uh, Cause I'm, exactly. I, I came into this world, uh, the pop culture and that kind of stuff through like non-sports update and sketch cards. And, okay. and I, when I used to go to San Diego Comic-Con, Inkworks started doing sketch cards and they used to have sketch card artists at their booth. And I used to come up and have them do crazy stuff. Kind of like, you know, like I had them do, they had the Family Guy license, right? So, like, I had them do, like, I did a, a one where they did Stewie as Vader standing, okay. like, on the a dresser, and he's like, who's your daddy now, fat man? You know, was the little quote. <laughs> 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 or, like, he had Stewie being chased by a boulder, like, in, dressed as Indiana Jones, and the boulder was, uh, uh, What's his name's face? Peter's face, <laughs> you know. So like, I would just do crazy stuff like that to have them draw, you know. And well, it's sketch cards, you know. Back in the day, I don't know what they are right now, but like tops paid like a dollar yeah. twenty five per. Card. It was so bad. I mean, it was. But but back then, and, you know, uh, that was how you got into like some of the bigger business later on. I guess a lot of them went on. You could get noticed, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's so funny. Somewhere in this office, um, as you can see, it's a it's a pit of despair. I have <laughs> almost because um, I would do like my my comp cards and things like that, but not always. So I have a box somewhere in here that is like nothing but blank sketch cards from sets from ten years ago. <laughs> you could pull those out, draw on them, and put them on eBay and get a lot, a lot. Well, it's um, if if I ever need to replace my roof again, I'll like that'll well, be my last effort. I have so much to draw right now that it's like uh, every time I think of like digging them out, I'm like, no. Especially if like one of the older uh, ones, I'm gonna have to move a box. If it's one of the older ones. You probably get a couple hundred dollars for them. Oh, um, Just throw it up there. There were a few like Lord of the Rings. I used to get a lot of money for my comp cards. And then I actually have some Marvel and star Wars stuff sitting around somewhere. But like I said, it's one of those things of like, every time I think of it, I'm like, I'm going to do that. And then it's like, eh, well, eh. like the least motivated person when it comes to something. <laughs> it was like, Oh, you want me to find the thing? Oh, I don't know. Well, I think, I mean, I used to even go to your table back, you know, when there wasn't lines and stuff at, Comic Con, and you'd be able to like talk. And now, and then it was a 2010, 11, you started to have to like cut the line off like after five minutes and like talk a little bit about like going from you know the smaller lines to then having to force people to not be able to get in line. It's it's insane at some of the other shows, you know, the, the bigger stuff like San Diego or Emerald city or C2E2 or New York, because, you know, it's, it can be upwards of two hours or more, um, to see me, um, which is just absolutely bizarre, um, to me. Um, I, you're talking to somebody that was stood up for her own prom. I was not a popular kid. <laughs> <laughs> So now, you know, when I when I get to San Diego, like some mornings, we have to do the thing where we're like, excuse me, you can't get in line yet. The doors aren't open yet. And they're like, I'm just going to hang out right over here. I'm not in line. 
And then, you know, they, the second the doors open, we all of a sudden have a line that we have to cap because we're already, you know, going down, you know, the aisle and we already know it's going to be a two and a half hour wait. And I have a panel that I have to be up by one. Um, My husband is really great at judging, you know, how many people are left or my friend Isabel that does basically every other show besides San Diego with me. She's like, I see this many people in line. I already asked that person's getting two, this person's getting this, this person's getting this, this person's getting this. This is going to take you an hour and a half to get it done. And then she's like, and then you can't be a chatty Kathy. So if anybody mentions Star Wars or the Muppets, just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and I think and after uh, when it first started happening, you started like, I don't know, a lot of other authors started taking like the commissions and then just going back to the hotel room and basically for the rest of the night, doing a lot of those commissions, right? I don't do that anymore. It's I, I spend all day doing the, the mini paintings mm-hmm. that now at the larger shows, I go out and I eat a nice dinner. I drink a bottle of wine and then I go to bed. <laughs> I, don't, Trust me. I don't go to any parties. I don't want to stay up until two or three in the morning doing a larger piece. I just go have a good night in a city that I'm not familiar with. And then I fall asleep. Yeah, you- <laughs> See, the truth is, is because you have to be up at three to get in the Funko lines. See, now you're busted. Well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I got to get up at six because I got to like, I got to like make my hair look nice. <laughs> because well, every year at New York, Com- I put on my flannel shirt. At New York Comic Con, we would, it would be so crazy. And I had, my friends would help me out with the booth and set up and sales and all that stuff. Come Saturday night or Sunday night, we're all packed up. We luckily my office was on thirty seventh and or thirty eighth and Broadway or in uh, an eighth. So like, all I had to do was pack up the hand truck and wheel it like three blocks to my office. <laughs> and uh, so after we were done wheeling everything back to the office, uh, we'd hit up uh, Jack's Steakhouse, right? And I would always order like the four hundred dollar Kobe steak because it was a family style. And like, and then like the special, like they had maple, uh, maple bacon as a side. Like everybody got a really nice thick cut maple bacon to reward everybody for all of the hard work for the weekend because it's insane how crazy these conventions are now. Yeah, it's um, San Diego and New York. Like Sunday night is like go all out on dinner. Yep. Usually, like I said, it's because I'm all New York. I leave early, like almost every night again to go see a Broadway show with my friend Isabel. Because, like, there'll be a sign out going, like, have tickets to something. Bye. Um, well, but yeah, it's like I just want, I want a nice dinner. I'm so old now. Like, I remember younger going to conventions and it was like, I got tickets to this party. I got tickets to this event. I got tickets to this. Oh, someone gave me a wristband to this. Nowadays, um, I got a wristband to a really exclusive party at New York um, a couple years ago. And I just looked at it and it was for a publisher that I worked for. And I was like, I don't want to go to this. I'm not going to this. And it was my friend that was like, "You, ha- it's your boss. <laughs> you have to. She's like, it has an open bar and food. Just go. And I was like, I don't want to. Right. <laughs> and so she went to go run an errand beforehand. And I gave her the other pass. And then she found me about half an hour after I got there. And I was like, oh, you didn't text me that you were here. And she's like, I found the darkest this corner closest to the bar and i knew that's where you would be <laughs> and it was like oh that tracks that's fair yeah we i mean one of the fun things about san diego was always going to the parties and the food and and so back and then it got super crowded and then parties even got like even harder to get into i think they ended up moving like some of them to like yachts you know off oh yeah you yes. know it was insane, you know, that like Lucasfilm used to have a party every year, but it's like there's only so many rooftop terraces yeah. in the gas lamp district of San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> I think I've checked them all and off. Like, it's uh, and it was just um, like I said, it's you know, people would drop off 
invites to things or text me going, I left your name here. Come on. And it was like, nah. Or, or I could sit in my room and <laughs> read a book. But see, <laughs> I look back at the memories. Like I went pretty much party hopping one night with, with Matt Smith and Kit Harrington. So like, I I don't know how many times I would turn that down again. Still, well, it really does depend on who you're with. It's um, it's so funny. It's San Diego, especially. You know, I'm pretty sure half of those people just want to hang out with my husband anyway. So it was like, you go, you go do this, have fun, well, the- um, because he is way more um, extroverted at some of these things than I am, and he's way more charming. <laughs> Or as I'm just like, Meh. well, see, that's <laughs> the, the, that was the grumpy badger in the corner. That was what, what the beauty of uh, San Diego before like 2012, 2011 was that you could just go to dinner and across the table from you was whoever. Like I remember one time I went to Dick's um, and last resort and yep. uh, I had my best friend's son with me that year. He had just turned 18 and I was taking him on a road trip in San Diego. Comic-Con was our last stop. Had the booth, the table and stuff there. And he missed, he couldn't afford to do the the Mark Hamill signing, right? Like it was sold out. But then we were coming out, we're just walking on our way to the restaurant and there's Mark Hamill smoking a cigarette. And we're like, hey, how's it going? He's like, hey. And like, you mind taking a picture with him? And he took a picture with Mark Hamill. And it was like, it was wonderful meeting. He was like that. And we moved on. You know? <laughs> That's what it was like back then. Like you could literally just walk to the elevator, and, you know. They're so and so. Yeah, it's um, now not so much. One year at San Diego, back in the early days, um, walking down the street, I passed John Lasseter and Hayao Miyazaki, <laughs> like having a conversation, oh and it was God. just this moment of like, do I say anything? Do I say anything? And it was like the only thing that came out of my mouth was, "Hey." <laughs> yeah, you know, I think one of my highlights, I didn't get an autograph, but like I got to meet uh, Akira Toriyama at the Shogun Jump premiere in New York at the Chelsea Piers. But he wasn't signing anything. And I when I bought like the, the book, like his like coffee table book with all of his artwork and everything. I was like, damn, that would have been, you know, one of my dream signatures. I did get something from the creator of Bleach. That was fun. Um, I, I have, I have lots of signed books, but those are almost all from conventions. Yeah. But they're all like, you know, people I that are like peers and stuff at this point. Yeah. And then I have the bucket list people that I'm like, Oh, I can't go talk to that person. Although I will, um, I'm going to, I'm going to name drop for a moment. Cause this was so funny. Um, you know, just on Facebook, um, just a normal interaction, somebody that I went to high school with all of a sudden, like he was replying to something. I think it was about my kids. And I was going back and forth with Scotty about something. And someone's like, wait, you're friends with Scotty Young? I was like, oh yeah, I've known Scotty for about 10 years. Mm. And (laughs) my husband was like, oh man, he's going to shit his pants when he realized that Art Adams and Walt Simonson commented on this too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's that's uh, that was going to bring up my next question is is like once you get to the the status level that you are, right? You start to get these people who are celebrities in other people's minds or in your mind that are then fanboying for you, or their kids are. You no, know, it's I'm I I still consider myself like a total B lister, but you know it's it's been amazing, and I have I have met people that I looked up to when I was a kid who have just been so welcome and so opening with their time and attention um, that I, I, I couldn't be happier. You know, it's, I'm uh, like Stan Sakai asked me for directions to a hotel once a few years ago and I got oh freaked out because Stan Sakai knew my name <laughs> and now I see him and his wife all the time. And like, it was like, Gave me a hug. Well, it's it's hard to put into perspective, you know, when you're not in these kind of situations. And it kind of happened to me a little bit. You know, I'm not saying that I'm famous or anything like that, but I work because I work with actors on a regular basis. Right. And I know how a lot of people look at them. 
and to like I um, realized, you know, they're just normal people. <laughs> like we're all just normal people. Like people see them in this bubble. They see them in the same. But outside of that bubble, outside of the, they're just normal people. And it's hard to sometimes contextualize that when you're not around them and talk to them and, and stuff, you know, all the time. Well, it's, I, I just, I have such a great admiration for so many people that, that work in comics. Cause I, I love comic books. I love cartooning and, you know, the fact that I get to interact with some of these people, not only as peers, but as friends, I geek out all the time. <laughs> Like I have people that I've been friends with for 10 years that every time I see them, I'm like, look at you. <laughs> We're talking. And it was like, hi, I texted you last week. What do you want? And it was like, oh, I just, I just want to bask. Do you have, do you have a love favorite that project you did last week? Do you have a favorite comic book artist? Uh Oh, a loaded is, question. That's a really loaded question. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my God. Okay, so as far as influence as a child, um, I always wanted to be a newspaper cartoonist. So, I mean, that's when you get into your Bill Watterson, yeah. um, your Charles Schultz, you know, all of that stuff. And, I, I mean, I think even newspaper cartoonists sometimes have some of the most beautiful line art. I mean, it's just, and, and telling a story in four panels is just this, it's, it's such a hard thing to get that kind of visceral reaction out of three to four panels. Um, but then you get into, you know, comic book, comic books. And then I'm going to put um, one Jeff Smith mm -hmm. um, right up there because bone is the first time I realized that comic books didn't have to look like Jim Lee. That's not <laughs> a full on Jim Lee um, in any means, but I don't draw like Jim Lee. No. Um, you know, I, I, I have a much um, softer, cuter style. Um, so reading bone as a kid made me realize it was like, Oh, look at, the depth of story that you can get from from this kind of work so you have these bill watterson-esque backgrounds and then this character bone who is just so elegantly drawn and he's just these few lines and then you know you get into you know hayao miyazaki um like I said, stan sakai i love stan's work forever and then i love sergio aragonis that's where the idea for all my mini paintings came from is those little margin doodles he used to do from uh, Mad Magazine. And then I love Gru, um, which is great. Um, so I, I, if you'd like me to wax and wane poetically <laughs> about, about cartoonists for a while, I can. Well, that's so um, important. I mean, we, we want people here to talk about what they love, what they enjoy, and what, yeah, exactly. and that's so um, important of this show. I love, I love cartooning. I you know, I, I, I just, yeah. there's something wonderfully elegant and beautiful about the simplicity of line for some people that it's not all cross hatching. It's not all realistic. You know, well, it's, there's, you know, it's, I, I love just, it. I, we just, we just did this in a video. I think I, I, we actually just dropped this in a video today and it's one of my favorite and it's your, your guy, you know, him. I mean, it's just so fun. It's it's a Scotty Young mm -hmm. Spider Woman. And I just yeah, love the way he just did the negative space. Yeah, it's Scotty's work has this amazing complexity to it when it's so when it's not complex, and that's basically almost the definition of cartooning. Mm -hmm. Um so I, you know, like I said, I think Scotty's a master. Um, and the fact that he is not 80 years old doing that work means he's just going to get better, <laughs> um, which is just really irritating. <laughs> One of the, the, it's a lot of the artwork that I started collecting myself was anime cells back in the early 2000, uh, because I loved, you know, getting the full like a one cells with the hat that came with the original watercolor backgrounds. You know, and then they would have like the different layers and they actually would come with the sketches as well. You know, like, so oh. I have a lot of like, I mean, yeah. of, of uh, Akira Toriyama's ones, like from his all the way back to like Dr. Slump. Uh, and I like to think like maybe he actually animated this one cell, you know, because, you know, back then, we have you know, you, you just didn't have it. And to, to have the originals 
you know, because they actually use these, you know, to film, you know, like, to, and then everything switched to digital, you know. Yeah, it's, um, well, it's, we have, of all the nerd things in our house, oh my God, we have only one animated cell. It was a birthday gift I gave to my husband a few years ago um, from the animated version of Watership Down. Um, I found a perfect cell of Fiverr, who is the main rabbit from it. And my husband loves Watership Down. I mean, um, his unique name at the university he works at is a reference to Watership Down instead of his actual name. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, ah. I think I have in I my garage. Herman to always give the best gift. I think I have in my garage because I didn't actually find a place because I, I actually need to, to get it cleaned a little bit. But uh, mm -hmm. I have... An original concept sketch of the ice planet from Treasure Planet, from the Disney Treasure Planet, black and white. Ooh, the original yeah. sketch. It actually says property. I think Fox do not sell or do not, like this is <laughs> this is owned by Fox, like all over it. Like and it's the it's the original like sketch, and it's like that big, and it's like got tissue paper. Like it's, I've got it sitting in my rolled up in a tube in my garage somewhere that I need to like pull out and get framed and stuff but like it was just gorgeous because it's not only was it like the planet but it was like uh, i think like the characters for the planet like it, it was really really cool i have uh some original concept art from star wars of the porgs and the caretakers sitting in one of the drawers behind me but i did it so i don't think it counts <laughs> so, um, yeah I, I have uh some original i think i think i'm the only one <laughs> Collecting. I mean, Lucasfilm technically owns it, but are there in in your children's books? Are there porgs being eaten by Chewbacca? Um, he lo he looks at them sideways. He's looking at him a little funny. <laughs> um, but I did uh in Star Wars: Search Your Feelings. Um, in frustrated with all the porgs and Chewie's throwing a hissy fit in the cockpit of the Falcon, I put my family as porgs. Um, in it. But I have hidden, uh, my husband is on the Jedi Council. That made it through. Oh my gosh. Um, um, I am an X-Wing pilot in one of the books. That made it through. My kids are porgs. My kids are both ponies, by the way. Um, my husband is in My Little Pony, but he's not a pony. He's a donkey, which he will never forgive me for. <laughs> Um, Cosplay is a pony. I'm a pony in the comics, and they actually made Andy Price and I ponies on the show. Oh. Um, they took our character designs from the comics and they put us in a couple episodes of the show. Um, I'm from Michigan, so I'm the representative from Detroit. <laughs> um, and. Like you can actually like you can buy my there's a My Little Pony mobile game and you can buy my character as like in a like a, I hate in app purchases but part of me was like God damn right I'm worth three ninety nine and uh, it's so funny because um, Hasbro let me name the pony. Um, you know, cause it was a big surprise. Um, you know, the, the director of the show and the assistant director, I I've known Jim Miller forever. And, you know, he was like, we made you a pony. And I was like, what do you mean you made me a pony? He's like, we made you a pony on the show. And he showed me concept drawings of it. And not only am I, I'm a pony, but I was next to a fresh Prince of Bel Air pony. And I was like, yeah, look at the company I keep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they were like you get to name it so I sent in two suggestions um, one was bittersweet which is what I wanted it to be and then I named the uh, like the other one was like drunk suburban mom and Hasbro was like let's go with bittersweet <laughs> <laughs> and that comes from the age old art directing uh, thing you have to always submit one idea that's so terrible they'll never pick it. Yeah, and then the to other go one's great. with the other one that you're like, that's the one I want you to pick. That's actually from a corn nuts uh, thing, by the way. If you if you're not familiar with advertising, <laughs> that's great. One of my favorite things is that. Um, did you ever know that corn nuts used to have like I don't even like corn nuts, but they used to have a theme song for like commercials. No. <laughs> I did not. No, I didn't know that. 
Um, I'm, I'm going, going straight to, to YouTube uh, after this, though. Yeah. And the art directors pitched the commercial that they wanted. And then they pitched one that was like, this is so god awful. They're not going to pick it. And they picked the bad one. They picked the bad one. <laughs> that is why. For a few months, Corn Nuts had the theme song and the tagline, Bust a Nut, Bust a Nut. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. That's awesome. Oh, they've tried to bury that. But that is fantastic. My God. That is a mwah moment, and uh, I bring it up all the time because I call it like it was like here's the one I want to do, and here's the bust a nut. Yeah, nice. <laughs> See, but one of these times you're gonna have your corn, corn nut moment where they pick the bust a nut. I know it's gonna happen. It's gonna. We it's just. A, it. It's gonna happen one of these times. <laughs> we are all. We all live in fear when you work in licensing that they're going to pick the busted nut idea. Well, what we need to do is we'll have like, like al oh, well, alternate reality My Little Pony world. And in that world, your pony's uh, called Drunk Suburban Mom. Uh, well, it's I did a um, they did a series for IDW that was alternate universe. Mm -hmm. Like so you can write like an alternate timeline. Oh, like and there was a. Yeah, and there was a moment where they kind of picked the one that I was like, maybe not that one. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and then it ended up being hysterical. So I was like, all right. <laughs> Got that out of my system. <laughs> Drunk suburban mom pony is in a relationship with Bust the Nut Pony. Well, it's and... I made, um, there is a <laughs> character in the show called Prince Blue Blood who is the most spoiled, rotten, arrogant POS on the entire show. And I made him the main character. <laughs> um, like he was the one that was chosen to be like the, the main student of Celestia, all these other things. And there are, there's references to Hudson Hawk in it. It is, I mean, it is just yeah. the weirdest, most bizarre of all the issues I did. And it was after I finished writing it, it was like, no, I liked that. That was that was enjoyable because he's just a <laughs> jerk. It's like every because the there's people attacking because it's a retelling of the first episode, but with him as the main. And every time the villain attacks, he keeps shoving people in front of him <laughs> like a bad guy. And he was like, "Oh, oh God. my God, shield, human shield." Um, yeah. And he's obsessed with his Pomeranian, and he's like, "Bunny ball ball." See, that's what I've always loved and had a fascination of writing. Like we've talked about on this show a few times where characters make shows because all the stories have been told. Like you'll see like some kind of world event happen uh, a year later. Every single TV show is doing an episode with that as a setting. Right. And so you're always looking to see how do these characters interact in this situation or in this story. Right. And that's what I love the whole idea of what if writing. What if we took this character and put him in this situation? What would happen? And your imagination just goes wild. And I think that's what you do amazingly is you're able to to take these characters or take these things and put them in these just amazing scenarios and situations. And like I said, what if writing is my favorite? Oh, yeah, it's I I do like to write and it's, you know, I'm I'm a humor writer through and through it's when i do stuff it's it's funny i've tried to do dramatic and oh god i'm so bad at it it's because i i hate when things are dour and upsetting <laughs> and ugh. it's like anytime it's a tv show where everything is just upsetting it was like can we just hit somebody with a pie and break the tension oh god i don't care if he's addicted to heroin hit him with a pie <laughs> well i think that was what was great about firefly is it straddled that line of like just as soon as you think it would get serious mal would crack a joke jane would be like i'll be in my bunk you know just some some yep yeah we just started that with my 10 year old yeah. too there, oh, some oh, it's like oh and it's like oh no i have to tell her that there's only one season of it when it's over oh no <laughs> yeah here's the here's the show here's the movie be depressed like the rest of us Welcome. Again, there you go. And now you but can it's the wallow. Same thing with, 
Well, let's think of Mandalorian. You know, it's it was just nominated for best drama right. yeah. of all things. But think of how many lovely little comedic moments they have to break the tension yep. 100%. with this this whole storyline. Well, to circle back before we were we were the show went live, we were talking about like Funko Pops and and mm-hmm. you know stuff. But you collect something that I personally had never heard of before. Uh, do you want to talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that? All right. Um, we brought up I collect Nendoroids. And I have to limit myself. You know, I, I don't watch every anime on the planet. I watch some of them. So I have some anime ones. But I do, I brought up, um, this is one of the Marvel ones. Little Doctor Strange. <laughs> but I love them because um, it takes me a while. I got to go. I'd have to go. I have drawers full of all their extra parts. But they have hands and arms and different legs and different face plates that you can change out. So you can pose them in all of these different styles. Um, and one, it's a great distraction. If you have kids and they are really bugging you, it was Tinkerbell. Can you please go put her in a different pose? Yeah. There you go. Take mm-hmm. 10 minutes and do that. Um, but yeah, I collect, you know, the, the ones from shows that I like. The Marvel ones, the Star Wars ones, the Disney ones. I adore Nendoroids. I think they are disgustingly cute. Um, I don't do Funko Pops or anything like that, but I do Nendoroids. Um, I did the the Palisades Muppet figures, um, Legos, like Star Wars Legos and the Harry Potter Legos, artwork, books, <laughs> lightsabers. So we do have a lot of, we have a lot of autograph collectors that, that watch the show and in our groups and stuff. And obviously with, Mar- with what Marco does, and Mike wanted to know, do you have like a Holy Grail autograph that you wish that you would own that you don't? <sighs> I have several that are very personal to me. You know, um, I have a lot of the Sesame Street actors. Uh, okay. including, um, I have a uh, Carol Spinney drew a picture of Big Bird for me that he signed. Oh, my God. Uh, hang up my hall. Yeah, it's um, and he sang me Rainbow Connection in the Big Bird voice and the Oscar voice, and I was pregnant at the wow. time, so I cried like a baby. Um, <laughs> and um, I have I have Lin Manuel Miranda and basically the entire original cast of Hamilton. That's incredible. Yeah. Okay. Is, um, but I, I think it might be as long as I had a sketch, even if it was just a little black and white doodle. Um, I love a Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah, that'd be. But I need to be there for it, like, because yeah. there's there's something about, like, I have an autograph from Chuck Jones, but it's not mine because I wasn't there to get it. Mm-hmm. So it's like it was after he died, but we um I bought a piece of artwork, and the dealer threw in this book plate that Chuck did as a thank you for buying it. And it was just this moment of like, oh, I'm really glad that he had it in his hands, but I wasn't there. Like I didn't get to say how much I love his work and what a great cartoonist I thought he was or how my weird neighbor across the street that collects six foot tall paintings of Native Americans is also named Chuck Jones and he's not fun. (laughs) (laughs) So, so... But I, I like the experience of if I have an autograph. We've like, had that conversation a lot on this show about, especially right now with kind of the way the world kind of turned for this last year and potentially this year and with conventions and just the going and getting an autograph in person. Right. And I've told I've told the story before on this show about we have a my wife and I have an autograph Funko Pop from uh, Ricky Whittle, who played uh, Lincoln in the 100. And uh, he's in uh, he's the lead in American Gods. And mm-hmm. we have not watched American Gods. I've watched a little bit of the 100. Went to this convention, not a Ricky Whittle fan whatsoever, but just meeting him and getting to know him. It's one of our favorite mm-hmm. autographs. And that's yeah, exactly what it's... we talk about. It's that connection, that that personal connection you get with them at that situation. Yeah, there's there's a few autographs that I have that are 
you know, from, from things that I don't watch a lot, but it's, you know, I, I know that person or we've yeah. interacted and I just, it's that much more special because it was like, Oh, we had fun and it's, we have a, a much better story than well, um, some things. And I would like to bring up very, very briefly. Um, don't send people random cards in the mail to their home address asking for an autograph. <laughs> um, There's actually uh, quite a few through the mail uh, people uh, yeah, that watch us. Kind of, um, yeah, we, I don't know if Paul's stop. in here. Please Paul, stop. Paul is a big through the mail autograph person. But it's through the mail to like an agent or something like that is fine. We get them, and I know a lot of other comic book artists that do. Um, and we all talk about you behind our backs, you like behind your back, sorry. Um, talking about how fucking creepy it is, but we get requests sent to our home address saying, please sign this card or please do a sketch and sign it and then send it back to me and unsolicited showing up to the house basically makes me think you're going through my garbage every Friday <laughs> and like picking out bits of my hair so just stop just stop we're all or you nobody you get any of those packages Stop with like a hundred things to sign oh my god i got almost an entire lawn box of my little pony comics once no way and the and the note was just like can you sign these and then send them on to andy and it was like there was no postage involved and it was like he emailed me and was like, did you get the box? It says it was delivered. And I never answered back. It was like, it was like, Ooh. I shoved them in the little library downtown. It was like, <laughs> like that, someone else has got a lot of collector variants. That's a little ballsy to do it without including postage or anything. Like, that's just like, here, not only are you going to do this for me, but you're going to pay for it also. No, but it's, I'm, <laughs> don't well, do it. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just don't send it to their home address i i cannot stress enough how often every comic book artist on facebook is like i just got another box that wants a signature or a sketch and wants me to send it to them and we all go cool more recycling for you this week well, like, somebody's going to be watching this playback holding their custom katie cook doll with the hair that they've gathered at your house for the last year and, and really be, be upset really be bummed that you're not happy that they've created this or we just gave somebody the idea of collecting a katie cook hair doll <laughs> <laughs> one of the two like, oh, I was trying which to happened first oh, no. uh, the real question oh. is does a person have a katie cook doll as katie cook or do they have a katie cook doll as my Little Pony, bittersweet. Oh, I have, I have like there's a there's a shelf back there where I have um, fan art that people have made me. That's normally Gronk or nothing special, but I do have drawings of me, which is adorable when a small child does it. <laughs> um, slightly less when it's a forty year old man. Um, <laughs> uh, my favorite is a because um, I'm. Let me remind you, I am the writer of My Little Pony, but I have a letter that I kept um, that was sent to me. And it was like, oh, my God, this kid did her research because she found me. And it is a little girl and there's all the ponies all drawn and it's colored. But it was like, dear Miss Cook, sometimes in the comics, Applejack appears without her hat. I prefer it <laughs> when she is wearing her hat. Please keep this in mind for future comics. Thank you. <laughs> it's like I would have been like in the next what? comic. I would have done an ep, like a, a panel where it's like it, they were leaving the house or whatever. Look, oh, forgot my hat. <laughs> well, I tried to convince the editor. I was like, we need a letter to the editor section just so I can publish this letter. <laughs> in the back and he was like technically it wasn't sent to us so we can't publish it if it was sent to idw we could have put it in but since it was sent to you it's basically a threat from a five-year-old i don't know well it sounds like a new <laughs> podcast idea right like uh we, we just go around asking people to show us their fan or their fan letters 
<laughs> we just get Katie. Um, we, we get Katie and all of our artist friends together, and we can talk about the weird shit that people have sent to their homes. Oh. <laughs> all right, we got one last thing I want to talk weird about stuff. before before we 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 end this. Um, you brought up Carol Spiney, uh, right? And at the beginning of the show, we showed my autograph sketch cards that you did, right? Mm -hmm. But funny story is, and I just remembered this, you, me, Carol, and Kane Holder were all at a show, a small little one um, uh, in Detroit. Um, it wasn't in Detroit. It was in the suburb. Oh, in city. Uh, it was put on by Ed oh, Webb, bye. right? Ed Webb was one of the co-hosts. Okay. It was a trading card thing. Okay. And that's where I got the idea for sketch autographs. I don't think they had been done. They'd never been okay. released in a set yet. Like none of the trading card companies had done it yet. And I was sitting there because my table was right next to Kane Holder. Uh, for you, those okay. that you don't know, Kane Holder was the one of the Friday the 13th. Um, I don't know if you were there. I think you were there because it was in Detroit or not a well, suburb of Detroit. Oh. It was in Michigan. My uh, my husband just texted me. He was like, are you sure it wasn't one of the ones in Chicago? Well, it might have been Ch no, yeah, Chicago, Chicago. Carol, yeah. Carol Scream. Yeah, it was Chicago. Yeah, not the, the, that's where the old... The husband's on fact-checking, Yeah, so yeah. husband's fact So I was sitting there at the table because me, it was because the shows are really slow on those small ones, right? So me and Kane Holder spent like the whole oh, weekend yeah. just chatting, right? And then I was like, I loved your artwork, and I loved it. And I'm like, you know what would be really cool is to have a Kane Holder Jason art done by Katie Cook and then signed by Kane. And then I was like, all right, that's cool. And then Carol Spiney was there, and I was like. That would be even cooler. Would we have her draw? I think he drew Big Bird and Oscar, and then I had him sign it as well. So those were the very first two. That would have been the show that I met. Yeah, Carol. those were the very first two sketch card autograph sketch cards that I'd ever done, and to my knowledge, that anybody had ever put together, like sketch autographs, combining the two. Because I don't think anybody had released them or done it in any of the trading card sets prior to that. But that is also the show. There were a lot of firsts for autographs there because Carol said that it was the first time somebody ever brought a trash can lid for him to sign. <laughs> That's um, such a good thing to sign, though. And it was a part of me that was like, oh, God damn it. How God, Uber wasn't a thing yet that. back then. It was like, I need to go get a metal <laughs> trash can lid. Yeah. God. And those were, and I ended up putting them in like mystery packs, I think. Uh, for some of the stuff that I did. But yeah, I just, because as soon as you brought up Carol Spiner, it's like clicked the memory of that show and yeah. and the idea of doing sketch autographs. And nice. so, uh, well, anyways, it's been amazing. And uh, we hope to have you back on if you're willing. Uh, oh, thank like you I for said, having me. We, we just, we like chatting fandom. And like I said, me and Mike always have to limit these things because we could seriously go on for like two or three hours. And that's just, you know, but uh, thanks again. Um, let's see, was there any final questions in chat? I think we're, we're good. No, I think that was it. A bunch of people, uh, people in the chat want, want to do some kind of autograph of the month club collaboration with Katie. So that's the that's the general consensus. It's gonna be covered in cat hair. <laughs> <laughs> the first ever Katie Cook cat, cat hair. hair. We'll take the cat from your cat hair from your cat. Put it on a card. Have you do the artwork and sign it all in one. I'll let you pick which cat. You can either have iPod, Nakatomi Tower, Doctor Spichemin, or but it, but it was uh, but it was uh, iPod that you based the the, the cat book on, right? Yes. So there we go. Yeah. So we need it. We need that it, we one. Need that it. one costs extra because then I got to go near her and she's gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Marco. Michael. Katie. <laughs> Bye. Bye.